Who is Rebecca Black? She's the Orange County teenager credited in Friday, which was probably the biggest viral media sensation of last year. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down on Friday, guys. Black teamed up with Arc Music Factory, which is a kind of a pop star fantasy experience uh, for celebrity hungry kids and their maybe celebrity hungrier parents. Uh, Arc Music Factory charges between two and four thousand dollars for the experience of having a song written for you and a music video to perform. But what a lot of people don't know is that Georgina Marquez Kelly, Rebecca Black's mother, actually planned this as a media literacy experience for her celebrity obsessed daughter to learn about the hard work that goes into creating a song and a music video. She wanted her to be less celebrity obsessed. <laughs> she was trying to activate what Len Masterman calls the technicist trap, where uh, students are discouraged when their amateur productions don't meet the professional standards of uh, the stuff they love. And Rebecca Black teaches us that, you know, the technicist trap is dead, and long live the technicist trap. It's dead because amateur media does compete with professional media in participatory environments. But it's alive because a lot of times it's still hold, held to the social standards of professionalism, so Rebecca Black gets mocked for being not quite professional enough. Uh, my students hate this song. My undergrads, when I asked them to think about how Rebecca Black was bullied in this experience, because she was bullied out of her high school, she's homeschooled now, they create some of the most mean-spirited stuff that replicates all of the negativity around Rebecca Black in the culture. But when I remove her name and I talk about a hypothetical scenario that is Rebecca Black-esque, all of a sudden they empathize and they think of ways that we can use discussion to uh, create a positive environment between kids and teachers and parents. The problem is that when we love and hate stuff, it can short circuit our reasoning process and our reflection, right? We can't just teach uh, hypothetical scenarios because events change the way that we think about stuff. Also, love and hate uh, spread in both random and social ways. It spreads through cumulative advantage, whereby we tend to love and hate the stuff that our peers love and hate, but uh, there's no real telling what that thing is actually going to be. I think this has some uh, implications for uh, something that I call unpredictable participation, because love spreads, but hate spreads too. And they spread for some of the similar reasons. So here are seven strategies for dealing with this in the classroom. Number one, ooh, I got a few extra seconds on here. Number one, acknowledge anxieties about content, about lack of knowledge, about dislike, about fear of getting in trouble from administrators and parents and adults and from feelings of alienation from popular culture. Number two, give students time to reflect on what they hate, but ask them to use their reasoning and empathy to try to imagine why other people might have different perspectives. Let them hate, and then make them use their reasoning to um, maybe mitigate some of the hatred. Three, use your aha moments wisely. Do not look directly into the aha moment. This was my biggest fault, right? When I tried to talk about Rebecca Black directly, all of my students went nuts. But when I uh, came up with a scenario and revealed Rebecca Black, it was a little bit more productive. Start from reality and ask questions first. Students have enough messy experiences in their media and in their real lives that we don't need to use hypotheticals and scenarios all the time to teach things like cyberbullying and other kinds of curriculum. Start with their actual problems. Also teach social systems and how they actually work. What role do we actually have in all social processes from democratic participation through the popularity of a meme? Number six, let participation get bad and ugly in a safe space. Model UN lets people empathize with positions that they would never actually hold in real life and also ask them to bring their values to the table in a safe way where they can debate with other people. And remember that we have a role in this process. We have to reflect on what we hate and what makes us angry because when we bring that stuff into the classroom, that's the kind of behavior that we model for students. This is all an attempt to do what the rock man spoon uh, calls humanizing the vacuum. When we humanize the vacuum, we imagine that media processes, even the ones that make us most uncomfortable, are made by real people who make real decisions. And that better understanding these people will help us better understand how media works and how it transmits. And it uh, will allow us to use empathy and good faith approaches while balancing it with our skepticism towards some of the stuff that we find most messy and uncomfortable. In that way, we finally start to see the producers of media as the real people, like Rebecca Black, who are actually responsible for the stuff that we hate. Thank you. <laughs>